Kevin Watt. Um, I'm one of the Universal Council members of the Universal School of Thought. We uh, attempted to do a video about a week ago, and it was pertaining to the Unk versus the Cross. Due to technical difficulties, we found it to be beneficial if we reshot the footage and added in a little bit more information and inspiration as we go into this topic. I want to start off by talking about the Unk. A lot of individuals call the place where the Unk was predominantly used, and in fact, it's Latin, so that was what they used in their language. The name of the place was Kemet, and the Unk was a symbol of life, eternal life immortality. It was called the breath of life or the key of the now. And the reason why it was called the key of the now because it was actually the key of life. If we look at the unk, we'll see an oval shape or a cipher, a circle that sits atop. Then you have a line running horizontal from east to west or west to east, however you choose. And then there's another line that runs perpendicular from that top horizontal. The line that runs perpendicular or vertical, south to north or north to south, these all signify eternal life. The reason or the way it does is because the circle that sits up the top represents the woman's womb, her, her vagina, and these two lines that run horizontal would represent either her eggs, ovaries, or legs open. This line that's running perpendicular from those that horizontal line represents the phallus or the penis of a man. And we know that the Big Bang Theory is not a theory, it's a fact. That's when the sperm hit the egg. That's the Big Bang. And when the man's penis meets the woman's vagina, it is at that point that we continue that eternal process called life. That's what's eternal about it. That's why it's the key, the key man and woman, together. Now, <clears throat> what we have on the right-hand side of this uh, emblem we call the Ankh, it is the cross. It was used by the Roman government, or the Roman Catholic Church, and it was used for capital punishment. We call it a crucifixion. The first four letters was crooks, crooks, and that signifies death. Now, what's interesting about this symbol is that it has a line that runs north to south or south to north, which is perpendicular or uh, vertical. And then we have a line that runs horizontal from no, uh, west to east or east to west, or, you know, uh, longitude. Now, if this emblem over here's straight lines represents the penis, then what does these straight lines represent? That's possibly two penises. Now, it's not an attack on anybody's religion or faith base or anything of that nature, but I found it very uh, paramount and vital and pertinent to education that we know the history of whatever it is that we study. There was a man named Constantine, Constantine the Great. He used to kill what we now call Christians, but at that time, they were actually Ethiopians from the Coptic church in Ethiopia or Sudan, Nubia, whatever you choose to call it. And he found it to be detrimental to his wealth to be murdering those that were followers of Karast. Karast. Karast is spelled K A R A S. T, which means anointed or chosen. And that's from where the Latins got this word, Christ. Christ. Um, 
it was taught that uh, the man that you call Jesus was the Christ, which means the anointed. For those that have investigated further, they will find that he was an Essene. which was a, a mystery school system that actually studied higher sciences not privy to the mass uh, or in mass say of people that roamed about on a day-to-day -day basis. They uh, dealt more with the metaphysical side of life. They dealt more with the spiritual side of life than what was taught to them by those in rulership or the hierarchy at that time. He was a Nazarene. So in just a second, let me clean off this board so we can get to it. I want to talk about it because it's all tied in. Please just be patient as I tie it in. The word beard comes from a Latin word Barbara Barbara which is where the word barber comes from and it means beard but it also is a perversion of a people that went to teach them you know them as the Berbers Berbers B-E-R-G Pardon me. B E R B E R. Berbers. Now, the Berbers were what we now consider the Moors. The Moors. The Moors was who brought them silk garments, taught them navigation, assisted them with um, hygiene. Because before the Berbers or the Moors met them, uh, the Caucasians at that time did not bathe. They brought them homemade soap. they um, um, begin to practice civilization with. Now back to Constantine. Constantine saw it as a, a financial problem to keep killing off these people when he could use them um, for, for, for a greater cause, which was profit. So what he decided was that he would convert his testament was that he was uh, covered in darkness during sleep and he had a vision. And in his vision, he saw this symbol and written atop it was four letters. Four letters. Written in Latin. And it stood for in home Signa Vince. In hunk Signa Vince. And it meant, and by this sign we conquer. And that began the, the Holy Crusades was when what you now call Christianity or Constantinian Christianity began to flood the land, including Africa, burning down, raping, and killing anyone that would not convert to Christianity. Now, it's important that I mention that the Greeks and the Romans, from which he came, uh, practiced uh, homosexuality. Their imagery of an angel was always little white boys that were naked with wings. And that teaching come from the Greeks. Uh, there was a goddess by the name of Aphrodite. It's where the word aphrodisiac come from. 
So when you look at the word Rome, you'll see the word romance. Well, romance was actually a trick that an individual played to coax someone into sexual uh, uh, activities. And they used to use elixirs. And today is no different. We call them date rape drugs. Or you can hear a song that, how many drinks will it take for you to come home with me? If that isn't um, an attempt to use some type of elixir or bad spirit spirits to coax someone into doing something they normally wouldn't do with their impaired judgment, inebriation, intoxication, and in the middle of the word intoxication, you got the word toxic. We talking about poisons. So these things that Aphrodite uh, signifies. Also, you have to remember who Aphrodite's son was. Her son name was Cupid. Cupid was this little naked white boy with wings, and he had a bow and arrow, and he had a heart on the end of the arrow. And he would shoot people, and they would fall in love with whoever was the first person they see. Now, not to stray too far, of course, if you go and Google and look up some of the ancient Greek and Roman gods, uh, you'll see depictions of these little white boys that were naked. Before 1974, homosexuality as a mental disorder, a mental disease. And it was also case studies shown that homosexuality and pedophilia was connected. Which is why I don't find it odd and that their orgies, not only their orgies, but it was uh, islands that they had, like the Isle of Lesbos where the word lesbian come from. It was full of Amazons. On this island, the roles were reversed. Instead of misogyny, you had to deal with feminism. Men were used for breeding prop, uh, properties. Nothing more. They would breed them, kill them all, or use them on the front line in war against Rome. Now, gymnasium. The word gymnasium is Latin, and it means naked. So, guess what they would do when they would train these young squires to be warriors? They would also use them as sexual toys because women were only used for sexual, uh, not sexual, but women were only used for reproductive purposes, which is why in the Bible, you can only find five virtuous women in that book. The rest of them were depicted or labeled, identified as either whores or vagabonds, crazy witches, things of that nature, because the people that had gotten their hands on the 800 manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Pool of Geshuron, Mount Hebron, had perverted it. They wanted it changed because they wanted to continue in their behavior without having any guilt towards their higher power or the teachings. This was Nicaea 325 B.C. Now, what took place uh, with, with Cupid and the, the, the angels that were uh, little white boys that were naked um, is not a, 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 a practice that ended in just Greece and Rome. Um, they actually have, they actually have um, websites and TV shows in attempts to apprehend pedophiles um, and 
in a lot of cases, these individuals that practice pedophilia, these are grown men that like little boys. The Roman Catholic Church has went under fire so many times. And on most occasions have come out unscathed with no charges for priests, bishops, etc. that were found fondling and sexually abusing little boys. If you go on Google and you pull up some of these statues of the men, uh, you will find them butt naked with little boys hanging around their naked genitalia. You will find pictures of men groping one another's private parts. The phallus is here. The phallus is there. Even though the book called the Bible, the basic instructions before leaving earth, speaks highly against homosexuality, especially in the book of Leviticus, from the, the Hebrew word Levi, Levi meaning law, Iticus meaning book, it was the book of law, but yet and still it's being practiced not only in the churches, in the uh, pews, but now we have homosexual pastors, deacons, etc., as if it's permissible. Now, let me make something perfectly clear. I take no position against an individual that chooses to live their life as a homosexual or a lesbian or transgender or whatever the case is. But me personally, I take up arms but not abuse or violence against the institution of homosexuality. It is the same with the uh, white power structure of white supremacy. I don't hate white people. That's preposterous. Some of the most supportive people that I know in my life, some of them happen to be Caucasian. But that does not mean that because I don't hate white people that I don't have a disdain or dislike or discomfort towards the disenfranchisement, the dysphoria of African descent because of white power structure known as white supremacy. I don't have to like one and like, and like the other or hate one and hate the other, there's a difference. Not all are practices of it. And I am neither a racist, nor am I a homophobic because of my standpoint and what I choose in my life and what I choose to teach my children and those that come in contact with me for. I teach the aunt. It's plainly seen as the emblem of life. I don't really teach on the cross because it was not something that Jesus carried. It was something that he decided to get on to pay for other sins according to their belief system. I'm not here to attack that. Now when I look at the name Jesus, I wonder where that name came from. So I'm a student of etymology, right? And so I wondered, okay, he's a Nazarene. Hmm, the word Jesus is Latin. So what did that angel tell Mary to name that baby when he whispered in her ear, name the child, blah, 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 blah. It couldn't be Jesus. The letter J is only 600 years old. His father's name wasn't Joseph. The letter J is only 600 years old. So what name was it? So by etymology, Going back into what language he spoke wasn't Hebrew. Hebrew isn't even a language. It's not a people. It's not a language. It's an action. If you go research it, you'll find in Aramaic, which was the language that Yahshua Ibn Yusuf, Yahshua Ibn Maryam spoke, 
you'll discover that Hebrew was an action and it means to cross over or to come from or to go to across the Tigris and Euphrates River, which was what Abraham, before he got the um, name changed to Abraham, was exactly what he did. He had crossed the Tigris and Euphrates River with his wife Sarah to get into Kemet, which you call Egypt. And that's why he said Hebrew, because that's what he was coming across. He was on his way to the Nile. So where did this name come from? When I approached some Hebrew Israelites, they were saying Ibri, Ibri, and it's spelled I B R I. That's what they say. That Hebrew is really Ibri, but the definition don't change. So I don't know what it is that, they, but you know, to each be they own, right? Now. So when I discovered that the word Jesus, Jesus, was a mutation of Latin, and in Latin this is how you spell it, because remember, they did not have a letter J at that time. It was an I with the E, with a Z, with the U, with the S, or also I've seen it change. Z-U-O-S. Jesus. Jesus. I have actually met some Spanish or Latino descent right here in the area that I work. And his name was not, his, this is how he spelled his name. He spelled his name like this. Because I heard them call him, right, Jose? I said, hey, how you spell your name? He said, J-O-S-E. I said, oh, okay, thank you. So it don't say Josie. It doesn't. Guess what it says? Jose. That's how you pronounce it. That's the enunciation, right? So when I found out that A Zeus, I went and looked up this part right here, i.e., to wit, right? Or to hail, right? To call. To call, and guess who this is? Zeus. Zeus. I was like, wow. Knowing that it comes from their culture, the Greek, the Roman, the Latin, that's exactly what it meant. So I was like, well, what was his name? So I discovered that in Aramaic, his name was spelled Yahshua, Yahshua, and that's not an apostrophe. That little marking that you see sitting in between the Y and the S is called an Ain, and it became Arabic, the Ain or the Alif or whatever, but it was to mean Yahshua, it's the place of an A. Look it up, but Yahshua, I've been Yusef, which is um, what you would say in English, Jesus, son of Joseph, right? funny thing about it is that if you take the name Yahshua also been replaced or transmutated to look like that Yahshua and you translate it into English it does not turn into Jesus guess what it turns into you put the J the O the S the H the A, the U, I mean the U, the A. Joshua, Joshua, Joshua. Where did the name Jesus come from? We already told you. Because what they like to do is do an inception and place themselves in a history that has nothing to do with them. And when you realize that, when you start seeing these Caucasian pictures of Jesus up, you automatically know that ain't what he looked like. Because even in our ancient scrolls, it said he had hair of wool, feet of bronze or brass, eyes of fire. You know, 
Those are not attributes of the Caucasian race. So who is that person on that picture that they were drawing? His name is Caesar Borgia, which is the second son of Pope Alexander, the sixth of Rome, right? And it was Michelangelo who was instructed to, pa to paint these white pictures of Jesus. It was not to steal our culture. It was because any race of people on this planet, besides the black man and black woman, have a God that looks like them. It's just a fact. They have a God that is personal to their own ethnicity and heritage and culture. Except for us who were accosted. We lost our language. We lost our name. We lost our uh, culture. We lost our history. You name it, it's gone. What they did was they rebuilt us. And so now we have actually, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? Adopted. We have adopted out there everything. It has gotten so bad to a point where we have developed Stockholm Syndrome. And Stockholm Syndrome is, is when an, a prisoner or a person being held captive begins to develop psychological thinking and feelings of admiration and love for the oppressor. And we attempt to be like, talk like, dress like, walk like, do everything like those that have whoever costed us. It's a real medical condition. It's called Stockholm Syndrome. And it is a byproduct of something called postpartum slave disorder or postpartum slave trauma and it is a result of us not having the knowledge of ourselves it's only natural because when we think about that which we don't have that which we don't know about our own selves it would only reaction. be a natural yeah a natural reaction that we would lack a self-worth and self-value when it comes to our heritage because it's it's unknown. It's alien to the majority of us. And so our behaviors would actually exemplify that missing science. I'm the science of ourselves. And so when I look at the black on black crime, 96% of the black on black crime being created by black people, I'm like, that ain't nothing but a byproduct or a, re a result of what's missing in our lives. We, there's no way we can patronize our own culture if we don't know it. We've created a whole new one. We've created a whole new culture. It was called the breaking process of a nigger. And that's exactly what we see being exhibited and instituted and supported by the same system that is set up to accost us. Now, what does that have to do with the cross and the arm? One symbolizes life, the other symbolizes death. There is nothing about the cross that I could find that symbolizes life. Even the man that was come to save lives had to die on it. They say it was to give or grant eternal life. But I have yet to see somebody come back from the grave and tell us whether or not the white man lied to us or not. Still waiting. And, uh, and Contrary to popular belief and religions, all due respect, everybody in the Bible is dead. Everybody in the Quran is dead. Everybody in the Torah is dead. Everybody that followed the, the eightfold path and the six keys of righteousness within Siddhartha, Guatemala, you know him as Buddha, is dead. Every single one, including Buddha. Um, Elijah Muhammad, Muhammad, dead, dead. Now some people say that he's up on a spaceship 20 miles above the earth's surface and that at the second coming he's going to drop 120 shams out of but the spaceship. at this point in time the only justice just us but that does not mean that there is no higher power of course there is and it makes no difference what name i choose to call it because the god that i understand the creator that i serve the the higher power that I attest that lives does not live above the clouds for me because I already know the earth is in space. The earth is already in space. 
And when you read space, there's no up, down, left, or right. There's no sense of direction. There's only sectors. Sectors. And so what I found is that I kept going without because I never looked within the energy. The energy. E N E R G Y is equally I N N E R capital G. The energy. It is God within us. It always has been. I I do I do believe, and I use that term very loosely because I know that there's a lie in the middle of the word belief, but that does not always ring true. Sometimes we have to have confidence in that which we learn, as long as it's supported by evidence, actual facts that can be shown and proven. Um, to me, uh, whether you say Jesus, that's your choice. Whether you say Yahshua ben Yusuf, whether you say Esau. Because in uh, Arabic, his name is Esau, I-S-A. But did he exist? To me, yeah, there was many. There was more than one Savior. Anybody that will get you out of a tough situation, a life-threatening situation, yeah. Was there somebody that came and died so that none of our sins would count as long as we believe in them? I don't know. I can only hope so. And I ain't met nobody that can actually say with certainty. Only with faith and belief can they say. And that's great. If it makes you a better person, then have at it. In fact, the Universal School of Thought is geared for one thing and one thing only. To accept all individuals regardless of what background they come from. Whether you're Christian, Muslim, Moor, uh, Shiite, Sunni. Whether you are Hebrew, Israelite, Jehovah's Witness, even the Satanists, it makes no difference as long as whatever it is that you are step studying on your own time benefits us as a whole. And what I mean by that is, if what you're studying doesn't improve your relationship with your fellow man, then I can find no value either in what you study or in your comprehension, apprehension, and living out what it is that you study. I'll let you choose which one it is. Because if it hasn't improved the quality, your ability to communicate with your own people, then what are you studying it for? Are you attempting to have a, 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 an intellectual masturbation match with individuals? Or are you using it to improve the situation that we find ourselves in? Because whether Christian, Hebrew, uh, Muslim, uh, more science temple, whatever it may be, we all still in the same situation right here on this planet, regardless of what you study. And I heard some people say, God is blessing me. That's great. Guess what? Somebody blessing the wicked too. And most of the wicked seem to be living pretty damn good, if you, if you ask me. So in my opinion, I have learned that when it comes to this cross, because we can look at things positive or negative. And when I look at this cross, I also see the longitudinal line the longitudinal line, excuse me, and the latitude line, right? And the line that runs perpendicular in metaphysics represents uh, eternal life, right? And the line that runs from west to east or longitudinal, right, actually represents moral conflict, the carnal self. And this together represents the crystallization. And they actually call this the burden of man. This cross has been called the burden of cross the, and the mind of the cup because a cup is a vessel that carries something, right? And what burden is it that we have to carry? The constant battle between righteousness and wickedness. Every human being, regardless of what we study, has to confront these things on a day-to-day -day basis and sometimes several times a day. So when I look at this emblem right here, it is a reminder for me that the truth is still prevalent and that if the truth don't stop you, nothing will. Because it ain't really a cross, it's a letter T. A cross will be more like an X. Would look more like that. That's a cross. X marks the spot. That's a letter T and it stands for truth, justice, righteousness, etc. As long as we remember that we are not as good or as bad as we think we are. 
Who am I to judge another man by what religion he follow? I could give a damn. It has nothing to do with me. That's your personal relationship with your higher power. A lot of times people choose religion over relationship. They never really strengthen that relationship with their higher power, but got a lot of information to share regarding religion, right? Can quote scripture after scripture, but when they come to living it out, no, nope, I don't see it. You know who live out the scriptures real well, though? A lot of us that are subservient to a lot of individuals and places of authority. We get real humble and meek then. We get as passive as a panda bear with a eucalyptic leaf, to be honest with you. But let somebody else tell it. They is the, they is right next to Jesus. Let them tell it. They right next to my prophet Muhammad. Let them tell it. But I ain't the one to tell you that crap. I'm going to tell you just like this. There's something that we need to discuss that we talked about just a tad bit earlier. And it was dealing with the misogyny that is being propagated. Not only in the Bible, but in society as a whole. For instance, if you take the unk, if you take the unk, right? Let's say this the unk. And you take and you curve the sides down like that, it represents, it's called the buckle, the girdle, or the blood of Isis. And it's said that on, a, on, on this emblem, sitting up the top, right here in the middle, was a red stone called a ruby. And it represented the menstrual cycle of a woman. And if I may, there is within... Uh, I want to make sure I tell you correctly. There was a spell, the 156 spell, within um, uh, either the Egyptian Book of the Dead or one of the texts. I'll find that information and get it back to you as soon as I can. Um, but it says in the 156 spell, it says, you possess your blood, Isis. You possess your power. You possess your ma your magic, Isis. The amulet is a protection of the Great One, which would drive off anyone who would perform a criminal act against you, right? Now, what's interesting about this emblem is that it was a buckle that was worn by all of the great deities within Kemet. Whenever they wore some type of garment, it was this knot of Isis that sat fastening their garments together, right? Now, what I found interesting about it was that it made me think about how we view a woman's menstrual cycle. Ew, that's nasty. That's disgusting. But it would be no eternal life on this planet. There would be no eternal life on this planet if, if a woman did not have a menstrual cycle. Because her menstrual cycle is what I call autumn season. Autumn season is when the leaves drop off of the tree. And what that is is that it sheds its old to make room for its new. And it's just like that with a woman's menstrual cycle. What she's actually doing is shedding the old eggs so that new eggs can take place. So that when a man penetrates and, and releases sperm, that it can travel to the eggs and bring new life. So that which has been seen as abhorrent or grotesque or detestable or nasty is actually a part of that which is glorious, eternal life. And so when I look at this symbol, it is a testament of a woman preparing to stand back upright and to prepare for her man. Now, unfortunately, there are some religions that practice and teach that the woman isn't as important as she is, unfortunately. So it does not surprise me that the psychological behavior of these women is the way that it is because of how we treat her, our disvalue of her. She is viewed as property. In the Bible, you could trade a woman off for a cattle, a donkey, and three chickens. Now that is something we need to, like property. They were used for the, prop, for the purpose of procreation and and it was natural that there's a verse in the Bible 
It's in Deuteronomy 22. And it says if a woman marries a man and she is not a virgin, she should be stoned to death. There's a verse within Deuteronomy. And it says that if a man fights another man and she gets involved and she grabs his testicles, that she should be killed. Because she grabbed that man's testicles by accident. This is written in the book. But we got to understand that individuals that have gotten their hands on our books have perverted it. So it is beneficial for us to use the eye of understanding. Now, the Bible also says, lean not into thy own understanding. That is ever so true. How dare I be so arrogant as to think that my understanding it's strong enough that I can lean on it, as if it's firmly founded. It's not understanding that it's firmly founded. It is a knowledge. Knowledge is firmly founded in actual facts. And if God ain't in the, in the center of it, it ain't no good to you no way. Because who do you think gave us brains to use? Who do you think gave us the knowledge of, whatever the case may be, or makes it possible for us to research and discover? We're talking about the truth. There's the great man once again, Yahshua, some say Jesus, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Funny that he should say that, because the way is the truth, and the light that causes one to see. Now, how can he be the way, the truth, and the light? He never said worship him. He said, follow me, not worship me. I can't find it anywhere in the 66 books. I can't find it nowhere in the 72 books that's within the Catholic Bible. They got six more, Bible, six more books in there. And I could not find it anywhere where he said, worship me. He said, follow me. And, and, and then when you get to a certain point in your journey, you find out that's your brother and you don't follow him. You walk beside him. But that's something that each individual has to discover for themselves. Real quick before we go. Going back to the unk. There was a man named Asar. He had a wife. Her, his, her name was Aset. Aset and Asar lived happily. Asar had a brother named Set. Let me use some English terms or Latin terms, Osiris. He had a wife named Isis. Not Isis, that bogus, made-up Islamic group that's supposed to be terrorizing in the place of Al-Qaeda, but Isis, the, the, the female deity of the first tr trinity, man, woman, and child. It was Osiris' birthday, and his brother Seth didn't like him because Osiris was loved by the people. He was very wise. And he had been given the duty of rulership of the underworld. Set sought to kill his brother. So he tricked him on his birthday. He said, I want to show you a magic trick. Get in his chest. So he locked his chest up. And he sailed him down to this place called the Isle of Biblos. Now, it's important that I mention at this time where the name Biblos or the Isle of Biblos has uh, relativity to. If you look at the word Holy Bible, H-O-L-Y-B-I-B-L-E, you will know that in its original wording, it was spelled H-E-L-I-O-S, B. I B L O S. Biblos. It means book. And that was the Isle of Books. They used to have a large archives, the Greeks did, on this Isle. That was one of their main suppositories for a lot of the philosophies before Homer, Aristoteles, Plato, Socrates, etc.
Now, Helios Biblos, when translated from Latin into English, before its transmutation to mean Holy Bible, Helios was the name of the sun that the Greeks called it. They called it Helios. And Biblos means book. So it meant sun book, which is why it isn't so surprising that each of the 12 disciples could be the 12 houses of the zodiac, right? And sitting right in the center of the 12 houses of the zodiac sits the sun. Go look it up. You'll see the sun sitting right there in the center. And the, that's the 13th sign, the 13th house. And just like the 12 houses of the zodiac, you know, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, or the 12 uh, zodiac signs, you know, Aries, Taurus, Cancer, Libra, Gemini, etc. That the 12 disciples also represent those 12 houses. And that Jesus, or Yahshua, being the 13th man, would be right there in the center. They rotate around it, did what he said. Just like the 12 houses rotate around the sun. Son of man, son of God, son of the sky. They, 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 they were interchangeable. In fact, in, in, in ancient Kemet, there's no consonants. So where somebody says Hotep, H-O-T-E-P, the only letters you would actually see if you wrote it out was the H-T-P. So when you see sun, the only letters you would see was S-N. So there was no differential or, 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 or um, derivative between S-U-N and S-O-N. So I just wanted to bring that little point up regarding such. Now, Osiris, or saw, climbed into this chest and set, sailed him to the Isle of Biblos. Lit him out the chest, killed him, then chopped his body up into 14 pieces. Now, later, oh, one of the pieces he threw to a, a, a fish of the water, right? Later, a, a set. Isis went looking for him and couldn't find him but started seeing body parts. So she started gathering up all these body parts and she found 13 pieces. Remember what I told you? 13. So finding these 13 pieces, one was missing. Guess what part it was that was missing? This right here, the facts. So this is what she did. She cried out very loud and they said it could be here from due east to west which means all across the world. Then she fastened a penis out of gold, attached it to the body that she had just put back together, and it became erect. She mounted it. And when he released, she got pregnant with her son. His name was Haru. Haru. But in Latin, they say Horus. Horus is, represents the sun. Let me, let me, matter of fact, before I go into that, let me take some space. Just right here. This all I need is this little space right here. And that's a blooper. Um, <laughs> that made the bloopers. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do in this space right here is I'm going to show you that a saw that you know is Osiris. He represents the sun as his rising. At 12 noon or midday is Horus. Horus. This is from where the words like horizon or horizontal or hours, like minutes, seconds, hours, that come from. Because time is actually calculated by the position of our sun. The first form of a clock was used to commit, and we called it the sundial. That was us that came up with that. And it's still on the hieroglyphics within the uh, temples and the, the pyramids of Giza. Anyway, so if Asa or uh, Osiris, I'm going to put that right here, Osiris represents the sun rising and Horus represents the sun 
at its highest meridian, which is high noon, then the setting of the sun, or the sun going down, would be their evil brother, Set, which represents the sun setting, or, in other words, which would represent the death of Vassar, the sun rising's death, every day. Set kills Osiris every day, at the end of the day, at dusk, when it starts to set. And Horus was the sun at its highest meridian for a reason, because it represents um, the rebirth of that which dies, just like the Greeks came up with the Sphinx. I mean, the, 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 the phoenix, pardon me. The phoenix is a bird of fire that burns itself up in its own ashes and resurrects itself from its own ashes every 24 hours. In ancient Kemet, the teachings of incarnation was dead. So you die every night, and every morning you wake up, you reborn again. It's a blessing. It's no difference. True and true and true in fact, indeed, there's no difference. Is it safe to say that the religions are actually saying the same thing, but using different dialects and characters to paint the same picture of an immortality or all knowing God that is orchestrating the natural flow of life? Possibly. Now, in closing, what I would like to propose is that instead of trying to search out our different differences in belief systems, etc., that we focus more on our similarities. Some people don't even believe in a creator, that everything just rushed together from primordial ooze or something. I said, well, where the primordial ooze come from? The protozoa organism? Okay, well, where the pro protozoa organism come from? It comes from a beam of light that touched water. That was the first light. Okay, well, where did that beam of light come from? Because even in the Bible, in the test to, and in the beginning, God said, uh, let there be light. So it means that light wasn't in existence yet. It was born from darkness. It had to be. If he says, let there be, not here, let there be light, then that means there was darkness before light. Right? So, where did that light come from? Out of the darkness. Well, what about the darkness? Where does that come from? I mean, you'd be amazed at what I hear about the dark matter. And I was like, well, dark matter is nothing but um, etheric properties. Uh, so, the question at its very essence is where did all of this come from? Where did the unk come from? Because the unk was used in Christianity. In Ethiopia, the, the Ethiopian Coptic Church of Karast actually carried the unk. And the, 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 the hoop at the top. Was the handle that they said they was carrying the actual cross back. And that represented the burden. So it ain't like they weren't using the symbol in Christianity or Christianity doesn't attest to commit. Because every time somebody say, I'm in, guess what they say? I'm in raw. I'm in raw. It just doesn't mean, and so mote it be. Because I'm in means hidden. It means hidden or a higher knowledge, or yet learned knowledge. So when somebody's saying, Amen, it isn't just a testament, or praise, or end of a prayer, it's also recognition. But then again, several words have different meanings. And as we argue the meanings, we forget one simple thing. Nobody actually knows the end like nobody actually knows the beginning. Somebody said that man came before women, or woman came before man. Who was there to record it? Who recorded it? I asked this about Genesis 1-1 as a matter of fact. Oh, let's say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
and the earth was without form, and it was covered in void, and the Spirit of God hovered above the earth, right? So I wondered, who was there to record that? Because there is no book in the Bible that God wrote himself. It's all inspired. So I went and checked to see who wrote Genesis. It was Moses. I was like, hold up. Moses was 2,000 years after Abraham. Abraham was 2,000 years before, I mean, after Adam. Why didn't Adam write it since he was the first one? Or, because he wasn't even made on the first day, for real. You won't tell what, day four, five, something like that? Yeah, day five, because day four was when the heaven, I mean, that the sun and the moon was made. So I was like, hold on. If the sun was created on day four, and the moon. Then what was the calculation of the first three days by? Because we know that time is counted by the sun. That won't even made yet. So what did the first three days get counted by? And who counted them? Who wrote that down? You know, there's things like that that we must admit that we don't know. Because Moses waited, what, 4,000 years before he wrote about the beginning of creation? 4,000 years later. Um, so what, what I come to find out is that we had to accept that we don't know. But I sure got a lot of questions if I make it there where I can talk to this guy. I sure got a lot of questions for him. And one of them is, what made you inspire that man to call the moon one of the lesser lights when the moon don't have no light of its own? It ain't nothing but a mirror. It reflects the light of the sun. That's it. It's a dead part of this earth that was capsized years ago. And when I mean years, I mean millions of years ago. But anyway, what I've discovered is, is that anytime humans write something or say something or do something, a strict eye will find error in it. And I don't care who it's inspired by. It can be inspired by God all it want. We got to remember the humanistic side of us. And if you go through this video, you probably going to find some error. If you didn't, you ain't looking hard enough. Because I'm a human being just like anybody else in this world that's alive and breathing, that's telling tales of nothing they can show and prove except in their own life for themselves. That's called faith. And with that in mind, we need not try to use our faith to battle other individuals with. It's none of their business. The only business that our faith have with other individuals, especially my own, is that how I'm living be a testament of how strong my faith is, regardless of what I go through. It ain't trying to tell you how you should live. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to shut up. Today I ran into... So when you say original man, you're saying an original intelligence or an original mind. When you're saying a grafted man, you're saying a grafted intelligence or a grafted mind. When you're saying mankind, you're saying a kind of man or a kind of intelligence. I do not belong to mankind. Let me get that straight first of all. I am man, an original man. I belong to man, not mankind. I'm not a kind of man. I don't deal with taxonomies and classifications of that sort. So I told him that what makes a man a man is his intelligence and his mind, his self-worth, his commitment, his responsibility. And responsibility is two words, and I'm going to be quiet after this, I promise. Respond and ability. And ability. Responsibility. And that's the ability to respond in an adult and a mature, mature like manner. And that's what dictates a man. That's what dictates a man. It is not by possessions. It's not if I have a wife or not. It's not how I treat my children. Those are just places and people and things that I get to exhibit my manhood in. But what, I'm a man by myself. 
No woman makes me a man. No child makes me a man. Those are just places where I train and show forth and prove that I am what I say that I am. So when the individual said that, I had to tighten him up a little bit and he ain't take it too well. And it's not even my business because I'm going to tell you something. I go down to this building at least once a week and I deal with guys that are unfortunate or homeless and they eat down there and we sit and we talk. And I done met some of the most intelligent people that are homeless. And I met some of the dumbest motherfuckers that got jobs and they got houses. I really have. So it's not a dictation. It's not a dictation. It's not a deciding point of view whether a person has a house or whether they have a wife, whether they have a car that dictates whether they're a man. It improves their condition. It is a luxury. And in some cases, individuals think that it's a necessity and it ain't. You know it's a necessity? That you got some way to get from point A to B. It makes it more luxurious. It makes it more convenient, but don't get it twisted. Just because you don't have a roof over your head don't mean you ain't a man or you ain't a woman. You're going through hardship. And one thing I found out, anything I put before my creator will be the second thing that I lose. And I ain't even going to explain that. I ain't even going to explain that. Our problem is we're trying to fix a spiritual problem with materialistic things. We think that if I just have enough of this, if I just have enough of that, enough sex, enough gambling, enough drugs, enough alcohol, enough lying, enough cheating, enough of me, the self-egotistical, egotistical or narcissistic individuals, that just enough of that, then it'll fix how I feel. You know what I'm talking about right there in that gut feeling, right? That if you just get some more, if it just add to it, it'll go away. You can't fix a, 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 a permanent problem with a temporary situation, with a temporary fix. You can't fix a spiritual problem with materialistic remedies, which is really just sedation. It don't work. I've tried it for years. And I can tell you, regardless of what religion that it is you come from, we all face with the same dilemma. We're trying to improve our spirituality. Because for real, for real I truly do understand for myself today, just today, that if I do what I was put here for, then my life will be better. And when I go to bed at night, I know I did the best I could and I won't be tossing and turning through the night because it was a job well done. But if I go through my day robbing, stealing, cheating, killing, and all that, then how do I expect my end result to be? I mean, it's just something to think about. And if you ain't get anything out of this broadcast the entire time we had it going on, this one thing, just one thing that I want to get across to, and that is think while it's still free. My name is Kevin Watt. We can be reached at www.universalschoolofthought.org. Our phone number is 804-476-USOT. Thank y'all for joining me. And if you find anything that needs correction, all you got to do is just post a comment. That's all you got to do. Thank you for being with us this evening. Y'all take care and be kind to one another.